Hey everyone, I think we're starting. Thank you for coming. I'm going to show you uh, a little bit more of a deep dive into Cinemachine. And for those of you who are at yesterday's, thank you for coming back. This is me. And uh, I have like this sort of professional Twitter, which is Cinemachine updates and cinematography stuff. So if you're into that kind of thing and you want to see all the new tools and demos and just sort of stay live to when it's happening, follow that. That would be awesome. OK, so this is the overview for what's going to happen today. So what is this thing? You're in this room, probably be, you have an idea of what this thing is. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of the backstory because you probably feel like how I felt. And if you've done game cameras or cinematic cameras in game engines or in Maya or 3D, uh, you are either talking to a programmer or editing a big ball of code camera or you're keyframing stuff in a 3D package. And that's awesome. But the problem is, if something changes, the cameras don't know about the subject. There's no relationship. So you make all this camera stuff. And I'm talking more about like cutscenes right now, and you keyframe things, and then the situation changes, and it's broken. And that's painful, because stuff changes all the time. Uh, and then for game cameras, it's like this huge big ball of code. And it's scary. And you, you, know, you don't want to like, oh, I just want to do this thing when this part of the game happens. And it's uh, time consuming, or you're bugging programmers. And, and this, my vision for this is for that to all go away. And it's just like if you had a real camera and you just want to shoot something, your effort is spent on what's the best shot, what's the best move, what's the best way to reinforce gameplay, what's the best way to tell the story, not how do I make the camera do all this stuff. So really high level. On the right, we've got the Unity camera. And on the left, we've got Cinemachine virtual cameras. And the cameras that are in Cinemachine, they're not real. They're just an idea. They're basically empty. They're just coordinates. They're a lens. They're a little bit of instruction that you put in there. And we blend them all together, and we put them to the main camera. So you don't have tons of cameras in your scene. It's not really expensive. You're not like rendering multiple things. Basically, we're marionetting the game camera. And I started this history slide of all the games and games which didn't come out and all the stuff that was in the past, and then I just stopped because we can't talk about some of the games that get canceled. If you've ever been on a canceled game, you might know that. It's not a lot of fun. And the feature overview is kind of ridiculous, too, because we've, there's so much stuff in here. I'm, uh, this is just what's new in Cinemachine 2, which is in 2017-1. Uh, the best way to do this is not for me to try to spoon feed you all this information right now, but it's just for you to go into Unity, go to the Asset Store tab, type in Cinemachine, and just here it all is. And just throw it into your scene. OK. So the roadmap. You might be wondering, like, why is this thing on the Asset Store? And that's a really good question. And the post-processing stack, which is another awesome Unity feature that's also on the Asset Store. And, and Unity is working on a thing called the Package Manager. And a really quick story about what that thing does is instead of trying to put everything into Unity and having Unity be this giant ball, you know, just big everything, we're putting components on this thing called the Package Manager, and you just load them as you need it. So if you're just doing 2D games, you just get the stuff that you just need for 2D games. And if you're just doing you know, a different kind of project, like architectural, or maybe some like industrial something, or a different type of game, you're only loading the packages you need. So until that's done, Cinemachine and a few other things are in this sort of purgatory is too strong a word, but you know, they're hanging out on the asset store until that works. So that's why we're doing this. OK, so let's go in. So for some of you who have been following this like, or have messed with it or played with it, I'm going to start in a little bit of the shallow end of the pool. But trust me, you're going to see stuff you haven't seen before. It works in edit mode, and it works in play mode. And I don't like how Unity has edit mode and play mode. I think there's just make stuff. So for those of you who are familiar with those two modes, I am not playing the game right now. I'm in edit mode, and Cinemachine works. And this is the composer, and it lets you compose things on screen. And I'm going to be talking about this a lot. If you're in play mode, it works. And it saves it. And I mean, you just don't really want to deal with these two different ideas. You want to have everything that goes in the game as much possible in edit mode. Like, I just really would like to relax those boundaries. So we've been working really hard on that. So at the really simplest level, here's the Cinemachine panel. And we've got two different ideas here. See, aim. And aim is just what you're looking at. And it's just the camera rotations. 
and body is just where the camera is, and it's just the translations. And you can see we've got different options in there, and I'm going to get into those. And this is just how we've configured it. So it's like, where am I looking, and where is the camera? So I can go to a hard constraint, and it's just going to like pin super hard. And right now, the look at here is this uh, little guy's left eye bone. But hard constraints are no fun. So we're going to use a composer. And you can see here, and I'm going to open this up, you can click and drag right in the window too. Areas where there's no blue, blue is like a, it's like a squishy surface. It's, it's the dampening of the camera following something. So I'm going to turn the dampening off. And you can see that his eye, as long as it's moving in this dead space, the camera's not going to do anything. But the second it hits the blue, because they've got dampening set to zero, the camera will hard follow that. And this little open area is good for if you just want to kind of disregard high frequency motion on your character, or it comes in handy for all sorts of things. OK, so I've closed this up now a little bit, and I want to show you this. The camera's like super hard, attentively following his eye, and it's a bit distracting. So we can just throw in some dampening. And now you can see that the, the target is able to move away. And this is, there's mojo here. This is how you get your cameras to have a little bit of lag. Because we've watched so many movies, we've consumed so much media through a lens, the cameras weigh something. You never see them instantly start and stop, not in film and TV anyway. And cameramen aren't, they don't know exactly what the subject's going to do. So there's that latency. So we have this subconscious like, understanding that a little bit of latency feels right. So this is one way to do it. I mean, sometimes for gameplay cameras, you don't want that. But it's here, and that's what this dampening's for. OK, so you build your scenes up with tons of these things. So this is one right now. You can see all the other cameras are turned off. I'm just going to turn this one on. And we take a two-second blend, and we blend to this other camera. And this isn't a really great shot. We're just going to fix this right now. Let's move this up. I'm going to make the lens really wide. And I'm going to turn it off. And the reason why we're doing this two-second blend is because on the brain, which is the cinema machine, the master that does all the work, the default blend is set to be an ease in and ease out. I can set that to be one second. And you turn this camera on and off, and it's a one-second blend. And then what some of you saw yesterday, and I'm going to show you briefly again here, is you can build. I actually have to turn this off to build these guys. So we're just going to build a blend tree. And this is incredibly powerful, because what you can do now is you can say, from composer one to composer two, take two seconds. But from composer two, oops, that's not the one. From composer two, or 1.5, to composer one, take half a second. And this is a really simple example, but these things get huge. And you build really large state machine systems because your game will probably end up with like dozens. I've had hundreds of cameras in a game. And that's because you're going to have a lot of cameras for the player moving around the world, for world relative things. I mean, like if you think of a game like The Last of Us and think of how many different camera behaviors are related to world events, it's staggering. So this is how you do that. So I'm going to show you that blend right now. This is all easy stuff, but look at this. Two seconds to get to the shot, once at half a second to get back. So with code or with timeline, you turn on and off these cameras. You have tons of them. Two seconds to get there, one second to get back. And you see where I'm going. Like Those are just two. But now we can start triggering cameras that are like you know, your health, where you are in the world, anything you want. So here's the next bit. That's composer. We've talked about the composer bit. This is now follow mode. And I'm going to talk about the body. And that's where the camera lives. So I'm going to just set this to be a transposer. A transposer, it's like, it's like a GoPro, GoPro rig. It's a very simple. It listens to where you have the follow. See the follow here? And I'm following the mouse. And I'm 10 units back. That's just the default. It's not the greatest default, but. You know, it gets you going. So now I'm saying I'm going to turn the damping off. 
And this is basically like just bolting the camera to whatever you're following. You can see it causes problems because when you spin the feeding back, like this is really mega basic. This is basically the same as putting the camera in the hierarchy, like underneath the object. But the problem is when you start putting cameras as children of things, you, don't, you can't find them anymore. And then when you want to do something else and you want to animate them in a different way, they're buried under the child. So you don't put cameras under children. You tell cameras to follow things. And that way you can have your whole list of cameras on one side and they're not buried and lost under everything. So I'm going to turn this dampening up. And you can see he can kind of get away from me a little bit. And I stop and I pull up. This is very simple. This is a very simple thing, but it's handy for some stuff. And then we've got different tracking modes. So I can lock the target, but still keep my Y up. I can lock the target when this gets assigned. So as soon as the camera initializes, it will preserve the relationship that it has with the subject. Can lock to the target with no roll. Straight up lock to target. And if the, you know, if the thing goes upside down, you'll go upside down too. And then it has a, a world relative in world space. And that's really simple. That one's handy, but it's like a really, really basic one. This is the. This is where it gets exciting. So this is called the orbital transposer. And this guy can do a lot. So I'm just going to tell it to listen to camera X. That's the input, which is this guy right here. And you see it's got a lot of similar controls. But it has some really interesting stuff, too. So I'm following. I have the same dampening. But now, oh, let me just turn this off. We're not ready to talk about that yet. Now I can orbit the guy. And we've now put an input into the camera system. We've just got one axis. We can spin around. That's a bit quick. But you get where this is going. OK. So then what gets interesting is, is we've got all these different controls to recenter the heading. So in a minute, I'm going to demo something with this stuff up on the left up here. Now, let's say in your game you want to foreshadow an event. So I'm going to hit this recentering. And what this will do is the recentering time is how long I wait, which is one second. And recentering um, time is how, how quickly it goes there. So example, I'm on target forward. I spin the control. I wait a second, and it comes back. Go the other way, I wait a second, and it comes back. If you don't ever want to let people do that, you can just go zero. And you're running around. And the second someone lets go, it just spins right back. And you can just keep this on one because it kind of shows it more. And then there's different modes for that. So world forward, what this does is it puts a world coordinate system on that recentering. And it gives you this heading bias. So I want people to look at this thing over here. But screw it, I'm going to go run around, I'm going to play the game, you let go, and it's like, no, 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 look over there. And this gets really interesting if you want to like foreshadow bits in the game, you want to lead people around. And the second they let go, and it recenters to a world heading. We can also recenter that to a velocity heading and a positional delta. And the velocity heading is like in a car racing game. The car's going forward, but say it goes into a power slide. Its direction has changed, but the velocity is still going in the same direction. So you don't want the camera to start spinning around because the car's going. So it'll actually align based on the velocity delta. I worked on Need for Speed for a while, and we came up with a lot of gizmos, and a bunch of that thinking is in here. OK. So the next thing, the next level of that is free look. And free look combines three of these things, but it puts them all into one idea. And for whoever was here yesterday, I'm going to just go through this briefly again. But free look is your third person action adventure camera. And if you look here, you can see that there's a ring on the bottom, a ring on the middle, and a ring on the top. And then there's this like kind of spliny guy here. And how this works is you set the camera controls for what you would like on the bottom and then what you'd like in the middle, and then what you'd like at the top. And then the y-axis on the controller will blend between all of those. And you've got a camera for each of those positions, and it blends between them. So you can do really cool stuff like 
hey, the top one, I want to be way higher. And I mean, the composition isn't great. When I get right up top, I want to be perfectly composed right in the middle. So you just move this guy. You can do it on screen. I find with the free look, it's a bit easier to do here. So now, you're seamlessly blending right to this top camera. And we spent a long time trying to get that math right so it's really smooth and there's no lumps. But if you're a weirdo and you want a lump, well, look how high I put that. That's way too high. But you get where it's going. 35, that's nuts. We've got a spline tension here. I don't know if you guys can see that. I'm going to show you the bottom bit here. We can see, uh, oops. You can see that the spline tension changes, so you can kind of scoop it out or make it a perfect sphere or half sphere. OK, so now you got this free look camera, and that's cool. And this is where a lot of games end. I've got a great orbit camera, cool. Well, on one project I was on, we had 21 of these things. And they were always blending between all the different states. And this is what blew up in my demo yesterday for whoever's there. It works now. So I want to do a different camera when we're sneaking. And a sneak is an event. And we have this thing called state-driven camera, and it's right here. It's called a state-driven camera. And what this thing does is it means you don't have to, the cameras in the animation system can talk really closely to each other. And how it works is it scrubs the whole project for different states. You can see them run, sneak, whatever. And then you can pick different cameras. So right now, when I sneak, which you can see right here, I want to play this sneak camera. Now, I just duplicated this free look, and I made another one, a version of it. Well, the game's running right now, and I want to tune this thing. But I don't want to sneak to tune it. So we've got the solo button. And those of you in the audio world are familiar. You just, I just want to solo this track. So watch this. You just hit the solo button and you'll solo that camera. So you can kind of just like hotwire it on for a second. And in this sneak free look, it's closer, and I've put a little bit of handheld shake on it. It's like a kind of a, you know, Gears of War roadie run, not quite. Let me just crank the noise up a bit just for giggles. Crank some frequency up a little bit more. You've got noise per, cha uh, noise per camera. Okay, so I'm gonna unsolo this dude. And I'm going to start playing, and then I hit the sneak mode, and then we push into the sneak camera. And I don't tune it now, like you get that, you know, you can tune this stuff. Without writing any code to the bugging programmers, you can experiment with changing the camera based on any animation state. And that's a huge world, like right there. Like that's, we're running through a tunnel, blend to a smaller free lick. We're going outside, blend to a bigger one. Five enemies run up, I'm injured. Like, you know, your minds can go wild with all the stuff you can do with that. Okay. So where it gets interesting is, I'm gonna just turn this off and we're gonna move to this other demo right here. I set this little trigger volume up. And I'm going to put this on. OK, so. OK, so I got my little free look going here. OK, and the dudes, oh, here we go. Yeah, there it is. So we're going to blend gameplay with some timeline stuff. So what we've got here is this timeline on the bottom. And you can see the clips that are here. I'll just zoom them up so you can see a bit more. And this trigger volume is going to blend from the free look camera to this dolly track. And then after a little bit of time, it's going to do some mixing and matching. So let's, let's just play that and see what happens. OK, so we're running our little guy around. We're going to hit the trigger volume. We're going to start timeline. The camera is going to blend. We've turned the game into a side scroller. The camera's going up the dolly. Now we're hitting this timeline, and we're blending in, and we're following them more closely. Change the FOV. We've come back, and then we blend back to the free look. 
This is a really simple example, but what I'm, what I'm trying to impart with you here is you can just start mixing and matching any of these ideas. You want to go on a dolly track for a little bit, and then you want to go to your free look. You can do that, and then when you're, you, know, you just start peppering your environment with these trigger volumes to really sculpt, um, you know, just really craft the cameras and get the, you know, reinforce whatever the gameplay is. And it's fast to tune, like I can just go into here and go like this. And we're just going to hit stop right here. And for those of you who saw the keynote, you'll see you can just drag these guys and move this around. And like right now, I'm like way too aggressively following his nose. Like, look at this. Look when he moves around. So we'll just put some dampening in. Just going to decouple that a little bit. Maybe just change the composition just a little bit. Maybe this whole dolly track is too low. OK, and then just keep playing and hit timeline again. You know, this, you get where I'm going. Like you just can, like I do, just noodle this stuff all day until you're blue in the face. So when I, when I'm, hopefully what you're seeing here, I'm hopefully like igniting your minds onto like, oh my God, this is some. We get this level in the gameplay where we want to swing the camera over here or put it on a dolly track or cascade multiple dolly tracks together. Okay, so you guys got that. So we're going to turn this off. We're going to go to another scene. I'll just close it. OK. So this scene, let me just get familiar with it here. And to do the signal machine dolly, we're going to open the timeline dolly. OK, this scene's got kind of, uh, it's got a much more different, we're mixing a few more things together. So we've created this dolly here, which is this big dolly through the world. We're not doing the automatic dolly. That dolly that you saw in the previous one, the camera was following the character. This one, I don't want it to be automatic. I want to actually drive the camera. So it's easy to do. You just pin this. Always remember to pin your timeline bar. I've got this animation curve here, and this animation curve is the camera's path down this dolly. So let me make this a little bit bigger. And all this key, this, uh, um, this keyframe, this uh, animation curve is doing is it's driving this path position. And you can even add more keys to it, and it will, you just animate it further past those keys. So it's, it doesn't reorient, um, reset the keys to one every time if you add more paths. So watch this. So we're procedurally targeting this guy here. We're pushing the camera down the dolly path. And we're getting this really big push in move. But then the composition starts to fall apart. Like, OK, that's cool. This is maybe a good dolly. If you had to animate this by hand, it would, I don't know, you could do with constraints, but then animating the constraints. Like, it, it'd, be, it'd, it'd take a little bit to get it right. So watch this. This composition, obviously, is pretty crap right now. So all you do is we've got the camera here. I'm going to just hit record. Select the camera, put the composition that you'd like at the start. And, and what we're doing is we're now dropping Cinemachine um, composer keyframes. And then we go to here, maybe we want them like this. Oops. And then we go to here, and we'll have them like, like this. And then we get right up next to his head. That's not bad. And then he swings, and we probably want it like this. And you get where I'm going. Really craft the shots that you want. And then he walks away. We're going to center it a bit more. And he goes like this, and we, whatever it is, put his feet back up. Oops. OK, turn off record. 
You can see on the timeline, we've got these keyframes, and we've dropped all these keyframes that are here. And those are the Cinemachine keyframes. And then look at this. I'll make this bigger so you can see it. We've got timeline driving the camera's path down the dolly track, composer procedurally composing his head, timeline driving the composer screen space uh, compositional offsets. And I don't, if there's some keyframe camera artists in the audience here, like this would be it would, be, it would be a pain to do. It would, be, it would take a little bit of time. What's crazy about this is you could say, you know, we're giving too much attention to his eye. Like, I don't want to target his eye anymore. Why don't we just target his neck? And it just all still goes. So you get where that's going. OK, cool. Do, any, I, do you have any questions at this bit? Is there anything you guys want to know? Should I blaze on? We're going to do some multi-point targeting. No? OK, we'll save it for the end. OK. So actually, I realized I forgot something. We're going to go back here. On this guy, we created this shot. Remember before I was saying don't put cameras as children of the subject, just make them just follow it. So back to the free look example, is I've got this POV shot right here and it's just, it looks like it's a child of his head bone, but I've just say, hey, be a child. This character's got a bone that's called look. And you can keep it flat so you can see where all your cameras are. And I'm just soloing it right now. But let's just say, and we did the two second blend because that's obviously the default. But let's just say when we do that sneak thing, we actually want to go to the POV shot, which is the one I just showed you. But we don't want to do a two second blend on that. So when we go to from free look, which is the camera that we're in normally, to POV, I don't want to blend, I want to cut. So here we are, a little guy running around. When I hit sneak, we're going to cut right to that POV shot. And I put it, there was no mode coming back, so it uses the default. So obviously, it's really simple. If you just wanted to make it cut both ways, you can say, man, any time I go from the POV camera to any other camera, be a cut. The anys are really powerful because then you don't have to, well, you can understand why. You don't have to set up these huge relationships between all the other ones. And look at that. Pop in, pop out. OK, so that's cool. So we're going to bounce back to this guy. All right. So let me go back to this main scene here. Just one sec. OK, so I'm going to just mute this track. You can see we've got lots of different tracks here. Unmute this one. OK, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new camera at the end. I'm going to show you making a new one. And this is going to be the multi-point targeting. I'm going to show you a feature just before that, though, that's uh, uh, part of that. So I'm just going to actually just make a straight up virtual camera. I'm going to just throw this guy onto here. And free up a little bit of room. It defaults to the camera being, you know, wherever in the world. So we're going to go back to where another dudes are. Uh, pro tip, do you guys know the control shift F? The people in the room that know it will say yes. But uh, if you don't know this trick, check this out. It aligns whatever selected with um, the scene view camera. So I just hit Control Shift F, 
and it will automatically align the camera with the scene view, which is super handy. So I can just move this over here. Oh, here let me give you a better example of that. The dudes are way back here. So you just select the camera. You can control shift F. You can see every time I hit it, I'm reframing the subject. So if you just like, hey, I really like the shot in the scene view, you can just hit control shift F and bam, you get that shot in the scene view. Okay, so we're gonna take this camera, we're gonna target the Adam character, which is right here. And we'll just find where he is. Okay, so he is, and we're gonna just target the Adam character. We're gonna look at him. I'm gonna drop the virtual camera just a little bit so we can get a better shot. And I lost the lighting somewhere. I'm not sure where that went. And then let's actually move up to find his uh, better bone right here. OK, so we're going to target his eye bone. And just jump into here really quick, get that. Maybe we'll just take his neck bone. Select the guy, find his neck bone, drop it in. There we go. OK, so sometimes when your guys are running around and you don't know where they are, you want to have them, you want to kind of keep them the same size on screen. So we have this new feature. I'm just going to make this bigger. So we have this new feature. And watch this. I'm just going to take this clip because I actually want to see him walking. I'm just going to drop this clip down here. Timeline sorts from the bottom up, which is a little bit weird. Uh, motion Builder sorts from the bottom up. We're going to add a button here that lets us sort from the top down or the bottom up, and that'll be your choice. But you can see right now that this clip that I've done is trumping all the other ones because it's on the bottom. OK, so watch this. I'm going to get this a little bit closer. These dudes are walking by. He's pulling the target. That's all cool. You can see the depth of field's changing just a little bit there because he's getting closer and the rack focus is coming in. I'm going to talk about that in a sec. But let's just say I'm really keen to keep this guy's head that size on screen. We've got this new mode. Anytime you're in Cinemachine, you can hit Add Component. And if you just start typing Cinemachine, you can see that all the other components are in there. And that big long list of features that I had, this is where they're all hiding out. We've got this thing called Follow Zoom. And this is, this is interesting. So what this does is you say how big you'd like something to be on the screen. Like, I want it to be this big on screen. I'm going to just change this to be his eye really quick, because his neck is a bit too low. Actually, it was a good time to show that you've got world space, uh, character space offsets. So you can actually move the target around. So like if, say you're like targeting a car and you don't have too many bones in there or anything, you can just offset where the camera's looking at. That's in local space of what you're tracking. OK, so watch this. So I've got this thing. I've got this, uh, the follow zoom. And I want to say I want that shot, the guy, to be this big. So as he's far away, and I'm going to turn the dampening off, he's going to stay that big. And as he gets closer, he's going to stay that big. And what's happening is the FOV of the lens is adjusting to maintain that guy's screen ratio, screen percentage on screen. And with zero dampening, it's pretty like computery. But what's really cool is you can crank the dampening up. And then if he moves quickly, I'm kind of torturing it right now. But it you know, feels a little bit like a, I don't know, like a sports broadcast or something. And the guys are rolling in. But what you can do is I've done some procedural dialogue scenes. And you say you want the heads to be both the same size. But then if they're not in the same spot, you don't cut and some guy's head small and the other guy's head's big and the other guy's head small. You just say, I want the guy's head to be this big. And no matter how you cut it, it works. And you can set limits too, like minimum FOV1. That's really telephoto. That's a bit insane. And maximum FOV 179 is completely bananas. So let's just set this to be like 40 and 10. And you get what's going to happen here. It's going to have a limit. It'll only zoom to that particular focal length. And then it'll softly stop at that. And then it'll blend it. And we're only going to zoom so far. And we're only going to go up to a 10 degree lens. And you can see it stops. And then he walks away and he gets smaller. So it's an interesting little feature. OK, moving on. 
just going to hijack this camera for a few more things. So I'm going to turn the follow zoom off. I'm going to add this component. Oh, no. There we go. I'm going to make a new thing here. Cinemachine group target. I'm going to put three things in here. We briefly tried this yesterday, but it. So what group target does is you've got a game with a lot of different targets in it, and this will uh, keep them all in track. So I'm going to go back to the group target. I'm going to put this guy in one, this guy in two, this guy in three. And what happens is, is this now, this object gets positioned based on the average position of all of those guys. So we've created this dummy object. I mean, you can do this in code, but it's just it's so much easier to have a gizmo for it, and it's so much easier to be able to bias the weight. So see these three guys, one, two, three? This virtual object is in the middle, and we can change the weight. So I can go like this, zero. A little bias over more of the other guy, but let's just keep it balanced. OK, so then we're going to take this camera, which is back up here, and we're going to target this new thing, which is the target group. So we're going to look at you. OK, and I don't like looking that far low down on it, so we're, OK, so here we go. I'm just going to fix that composition just briefly. OK, and then, you know how before I was showing you like the, the different modes, like uh, aim and, and body, we've got multiple ones in here. So now we've got this thing called Group Composer. And what Group Composer does is it's kind of like the idea I showed you just now with the keeping the thing on the, on the uh, keeping something on screen at the same size. So what we can do is we can set this group framing up. Whoa, that's too far. I might need to tune the limits of this just a little bit. And then what it does is we've got these controls for horizontal and for, uh, sorry, for zoom and for dolly. So I'm going to just move this guy around just a little bit more. Which one was he if you came to? OK, you can see here that I'm moving the gimbal, but the camera is actually not moving. And I'll explain why that's doing that in a sec. It's not moving in and out. Let's do like a little 3 quarter. OK. So this group composer, what it lets you do is it gives you a zoom, a dolly, or a dolly, then a zoom. And depending on what these guys are doing, the camera is going to, based on what you've set, it's going to zoom to keep them in frame, or dolly to keep them in frame, or zoom and dolly to keep them in frame. So if I grab this guy, and I move him, and I've turned it up too much, but I just want to accentuate it, the camera is going to zoom back to keep him in frame. Now, obviously, that's too sensitive, but I wanted you to see it. And right now, we're doing dolly, then zoom, I believe. Dolly, then zoom. I can say, no, no, I just want to do zoom only. And it's like, fine, you just want to zoom only. And then when you move them, you can see that the zoom's changing. And if they get really close together, it'll zoom in. Obviously, I'm just targeting their feet, but you get the idea. And then you pull it back, and it zooms out. Now, this is too much, obviously, so you just, you've got your group framing size right here, and you can control that. 0.8 is usually not a bad number. So that's another feature that uh, we, um, we think is going to work for two. Oh, yeah, here, and I went too far. See, now the guy can actually get off the screen. And there's a magic number in there that will be perfect for that. So with both of these, you can, you know, you're targeting multiple games. You're doing a 2D game. We support 2D now. Sin Machine does, supports ortho, or, uh, orthographic cameras. And, um, you know, these are just nuts and bolts. Like, I don't know what your game is, but we're trying to build the best nuts and bolts so you guys can make some really insanely sculpted, awesome cameras that would take, you know, a team of people and a bunch of programmers, and you guys can just try it out without, uh, you know, without really having to do too much work on it, hopefully. All right. So lastly, I'm going to go back to this guy right here for a sec. Uh, 
Uh, oh no, sorry, let's go right here. So the way that uh, the post effects work, what's the ratio here? How many guys are strictly mobile, just out of curiosity? Okay, about half, half-ish. That's good. So the, the post-processing stack, how many people have played with the post-processing stack? Okay, wow, awesome. A good bunch of you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, how it works with Cinemachine is this. You've got your main camera, and you put your post-processing behavior on it. And that's just what you do normally. That's this little guy down right here. But if you want to switch it with the Cinemachine cameras, and we've got a demo scene that we'll be releasing that has all this set up. But, but just so you know, you put a Cinemachine post-processing script also on the camera, and then you put one on each of your Cinemachine cameras. And that's where you put different ones. Like I got post six right here. I can change it and go post, oops, and put a different one. I can put post two on this one. And then open post two up. And I'm going to just make an example here, but let, let's go, you know, something awful. And you can see that the post effects are now cutting between those two shots. Uh, post processing stack number one doesn't support blending, but version two does. And it's, it's coming out with 2017.1. So you'll notice that there's also this other little click right here, which is focus tracks target. And what that does is that looks at the difference between the camera and whatever target you've got set. And it drives the post-processing depth of field value. See this crazy number here? And as these guys walk back and forth, that's auto-changing. So you don't have to like hand animate the distance of things. And it lets you to do, you know, like you can go super crazy and it's gonna just focus on whatever you're targeting. Don't ever do this, by the way. I'm just showing you. The the post effects, uh, you know. Like the overly miniaturization. And you know what this is? Like this looks small, right? Like this looks like Tiny Town. And isn't this interesting? Like this is back to the, my point I was making about us consuming so much media through a lens that we have this subconscious understanding that when I see crazy depth of field like that, the only time you ever see that is on miniatures because that's how optics work. So I feel this is small and it's only because I've watched like a thousand Brady Bunches and like, you know, TV shows growing up that you've we've all got this inherent understanding of, of that, and you need to get it right. And we're helping you get it right a bit by having this use camera FOV. And what this does is it gets it sort of in the ballpark. And what I mean by that is on really telephoto lenses, the depth of field effect is more pronounced. And for any photographers that are out there that know that you put on like a 50 mil lens or 100 and you focus on something, the background's gonna blur out. But when you have wide angle lenses, the truth is, it's actually the same amount of depth of field, and if you look it up, it's, that is the truth, but you don't notice it as much because the lens has got such a larger field of view, and you don't see that much depth of field. So that's what this little guy right here is, use camera FOV, and we're trying to prevent you from getting into too much trouble on the depth of field, and what I mean by that is by like super over-cranking it, unless that's what you want, that's your look, but we're trying to make sure that's okay, because when you do this kind of thing, it gets like, well, that's too much. And then you might be wondering why the camera is shaking around right now. And that's this guy right here. And I touched it on it a bit yesterday, but I'll go through it just quickly here today too. And every Cinemachine camera has got a virtual um, uh, procedural noise. So it's a per channel, per lens noise function. And what that lets you do is you can, we've given you a few to kind of get you started, but it's a, uh, it's a way to give some camera some life and like a little bit of handheld -y look without having to, uh, you just see it's really mild on that one, without actually having to animate that noise. And you can come up with a pretty good group. So when I mean by per channel, I mean on this example, I've just got orientation and I've got three layers, low frequency, mid frequency, high frequency, all mixing together. And it can be kind of in the ballpark. Uh, but if you want to just like tweak it a bit, we've got these overall amplitude gains. These are really handy because you can be like, I really like the texture of that noise, but it's just a bit too slow or a bit too much or whatever. And interesting, if you click and hold in timeline over top of the clip, the clip, it's a preview of the noise. You know, earlier I was saying like, I'm trying to relax the difference between gameplay, I mean, edit mode and play mode. Basically anywhere else, you'd have to like run the game to see what the noise is and pause the camera. And, 
And I want to bring all those things that you, as much as possible, from the play mode back into edit mode. So just click and hold in here, and you can see, and that's the, that's the handheld on that. So I'm hoping with these tools that you guys can just make some cool stuff. And I want you to reach out. We have these forums, the Unity forums. Uh, there's uh, one called the uh, Cinema Machine and Timeline. And it's a pretty active community. And if you've got questions or you're like, man, I'm working on this game and I'm trying to do this shot or I'm trying to get this move, just throw your question in there and we'll, uh, we'll answer it. And for some people, we've actually built components for them. Like we've built them specific uh, Cinema Machine things. And because we're here and not inside Unity, our turnaround time is daily. So if there's a feature that you need or something, and we'll talk about it, and it's like, OK, man, that is a great idea. Oh, well, not here. That's a Cinema Machine one, but you get it. And this is one really great thing about being separate and being on the asset store is we can update this instantly. So if we've got a bug or if there's something that you need, we'll put it in and you know, maybe get it to you within, by the end of the week or you know, really quickly. So when stuff goes into mainline Unity, obviously, you've got to wait to the next version, and it's much slower. So we can be really responsive. So that's about it. I mean, I can just go on and noodle this stuff forever, but we're near the end of the day, and it's near the end of the conference, and we're probably tired. And I don't know who stayed at the, uh, our hotel alarm went off at 3.30 this morning. Were any of you in that hotel where that happened? <laughs> <There's one. laughs> that's the worst. That's why I'm a zombie today. So I'm going to open it up to questions. Does anybody have anything they want to know? Is this the kind of thing, like, I mean, I geek out over this stuff so hard. Is this, are you looking at this going, yes, that looks good. We can use that. Or like, ah, oh, it's kind of not quite what we were looking for. <laughs> you like it? Good. Like, reach out. Like, you know, this follow focus thing, we, we cooked that up in a day. The one I was showing you with the keeping the guy's head on the same thing. And I got to give a props. Greg, you're probably watching this video. Greg Labute is the, the engineer that I work with. There's two of us on Cinema Machine, and uh, we're in the, the corner of Montreal uh, R&D, and we're having a lot of fun because this is really fun stuff to work on. So, any questions? Hey, so Hi. it's really cool. First of all, it's awesome. Do you Thank have you. any plans for doing transitions between the uh, between the clips and the timeline? So not just blending of the camera movement, but for example allowing us to write like a differ effect that appears over the screen as it goes from one camera to the other. Because the cut between walking around with the mouse and then yeah. cutting immediately into the sneak view yeah. was a little bit jarring. So if we could do like a little bit of black blending or something like that, it would be nice. Great. Great question. So you'd have to write a little bit of code to do that, but it wouldn't be too scary. And basically what you do is with the, the new post-processing stack is it supports layers. It's really cool. And you don't have to blend in the entire post-processing stack. You can say just blend in a vignette or like a screen color or some component of it. And then you'd make a new post-processing stack that was just that one layer. And then you'd call that over a certain amount of time, listening for when that blend happened. And one of the big things that we've done on uh, version 2 is uh, this bit. And we've basically completely opened it up. And for those of you that don't know the story, I um, built Cinema Machine to put on the asset store you know, myself. And then we had to kind of keep some of our secret stuff secret because I didn't want people to see what the math was on all the blending because we spent like forever trying to get that right. But then when you know, Unity acquired Cinema Machine, it's like, great, open it all up. So you can see exactly what we did and have fun with that. Um, and that's what this is. So that's the open API. We'll let you, you know, write code, extend, modify, and just configure it however your game needs. But that would be the approach I'd take. Hi. Hi. I was wondering, I, I didn't see anything about controlling which camera you act on. OK. And is there a way, for example, to use the system for, uh, for a multi-camera, like split-screen game, multiplayer? Fantastic uh, question. Yes. Uh, so this is how I will just do it really loosely, just so you can see. I have to say this gently, because uh, let me just show you something. 
So where is it right now? Turn my brain off. Uh, so what I want to do is I'm going to create a camera. And my brain is not working. Game object camera. The Unity camera has got a long history. It goes right back to Unity, like, number one. And if you look at it, it's not a very good camera. No offense to the people at Unity before. It's a field of view. And it's got clipping planes. Oh, and just so you know, clipping planes are in every cinema machine shot, too, because you, know, you want to really fine tune your shadows, or if you're behind a wall, you want to push the near clip planes out. So you can set clipping planes on every virtual camera. But if you look at the Unity camera, it's, not, it's, it's two ideas in one. It's a camera-ish, and it's a render target. So something that we're working on that's not out yet is we're going to keep this camera because it's a legacy and everybody has it, and we, you can't touch things that you know, are being used. But we're going to make two new ideas. We're going to make a virtual camera idea and a render target idea. And the reason why we're doing that is because basically the Unity camera, is, it's kind of just a render target. Like Cinemachine does all this marion editing, and then it posts to the camera. So why have an FOV? Like, we feel that there's an advantage to decoupling these ideas. And I'll give you an example why. So I'm going to put these two cameras next to each other. I'm getting to your question. Trust me, this is just a long-winded long, long -winded way. Thank you for your patience. I'm going to put a brain on this guy, Cinemachine brain. And then what happens is, is you set this camera's viewport to be whatever. And I'm going to like just so ghetto do this right now. And then you now have a bunch of Cinemachine cameras driving one render target. And you can see, look, super lame split screen. And then you have the other Cinemachine brain driving the other render target. So you put a Cinemachine brain on as many different cameras as you want. Obviously, your performance is going to go like you're going to kill it. But this is how you uh, look, picture in picture. So yeah, that's, uh, that's how that works. So we support it. Now, to be really honest with you, we haven't given this bags of testing. Uh, but in our initial test, it's working fine. But if you find a bug, let us know. Anybody else? I noticed that you have everything underneath a root uh, object. Yes. And that's also a bit what my question is about. Imagine yourself on a sailboat in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. And there's no, there's no zero level. The yeah. boat goes up and down, it goes like this. So what I have is my camera is uh, uh, in a hierarchy beneath the boat. Everything is, is underneath the boat. Yes. And, and would I still be able to use all these fancy tricks? You can. Great question. If you were to put the brain and all the cameras under root slash boat and animate this, Cinemachine is going to still try to find the horizon. And I mentioned this briefly yesterday. I'll, I'll explain it again because it's an important notion. Is Euler math is really good for emulating cameraman on a horizon. But when you get into positions of going over the top of the bottom, you get gimbal lock. And if you notice in, uh, like, it'll take a second to show you, but we don't have gimbal lock. So if you look at something that goes right below you, right over top, we handle it. And that's because we, we do some crazy math. So, with that boat example, the camera is still trying to find the horizon all the time, and it's not going to quite give you what you're looking for. So we thought that this might happen. I predicted your question. Not really. And look at this. On the Cinemachine brain, there's this thing called the World Up Override. And what you do is you point that to your boat, and now the entire camera system is um, not physically a child, but relationship. Like, we are looking at your boat rotation, and now we're going to rotate the horizon, and the whole camera system will be underneath. But you don't actually have to put it under it. So yes, it should work. Hi. Um, do you have any ways for handling collision for the camera? Yes. Oh my god. Didn't even get into that. OK, so I'm going to just take the camera track, throw it down here, make a new Cinemachine track, make a new camera, bang a new camera into there. It gets thrown wherever in the world it gets thrown. Here it is. And we're going to say, here, look at the mouse. So I'm going to target the mouse. And it's going to look at the mouse wherever it is. And then here it is. OK. And I'm just going to close these up because it'll make it a little better. So remember I said if you just hit this and you hit Cinemachine, we've got all sorts of different goodies in here. We've got a collider goodie. So 
I'm going to go back to this scene. Thanks for your patience while I bounce around. So how this works is I'm going to make this bigger. I'll just do it right here. We've got a line of sight, and we've got a curve feeler. And you can see I'm changing the sign. Is that showing up on the screen? It's pretty dark. I'll solo this camera so they turn red. Ding. So what this does is as soon as the camera is getting hit by a wall or tangled in anything, it'll move the camera out of the way, and you've got some dampening controls. And then as soon as something blocks your shot, so if you've got something that's getting in the way of the shot, which is the line of sight, it'll look at what you're looking at, and it'll preserve that. I've got some videos on Vimeo uh, that show that in action. But yes, we've got a collision system. I do want to give a caveat to coll ca camera collisions. So they're a super hard problem. Like, there's so many different use cases of it. So uh, we think this one's pretty good. But it's not going to, I can't say it's like an A plus, because like, there's so many different edge cases and collision systems. But yeah, just on any virtual camera, type collider, bam, there you go. You've got it going. Hi. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, so since it's always, it's virtual cameras, and it's always filming with the same camera, what about uh, culling? You know, like when we went into the mouse, we, we, we kind of saw the insides of the mouse. Is there a way to kind of even blend between culling groups or something? I don't know. Fantastic question. So we've got the clip lanes, which are here. But something that we're adding is we're adding a culling mode per, per shot. So it's a, it's a great question, and it's a, it's a needed feature. Um, and it'll just live right here. It'll just, say, it'll just be like a, the main camera. It'll just be basically this guy right here, culling mask. We're just going to put that right on the virtual one. So, and again, this is amazing. This is why being here is so awesome because we can do this and have it to, you know, right away. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you for coming. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs>